Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, we've got the story about an antivirus product that detects itself, IE's zero-day vulnerabilities that are actively being exploited, and how the internet can heal itself from almost any problem. Plus, a big batch of your feedback, a rock and roundup, and so much more in this week's episode of TechSnap. And welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. This is episode 76, and we streamed it live on September 20th, 2012. This episode is brought to you by GoDaddy.com, and I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by the incredible and amazing ScaleEngine.com. Go check it out. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is the professor, the admin, and the tech, Alan Jude. Hey, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hey, Alan. Episode 76. We're marching right Already? along. Yes. And uh, it feels like these, these in-between episodes, between uh, 70 and 80, are just kind of like the meat. And if we had seasons like last or like really drama shows, this would be like the Monster of the Week episode. So, But I don't want anybody to get the misconception. We actually have a huge freaking show. Not even a big show today. A huge freaking show. We've got a bunch of really breaking news that's been uh, fascinating to watch. Alan's going to cover that in a yep. minute. And in the feedback segment, we have gotten a ton of great stuff, but we also have some really fun and exciting uh, community events that are happening with our fellow audience members and some of them even involved like streaming a special event on scale engine and we're going to tell you all about that in the feedback and we have an awesome roundup this week too i'm really excited about today's episode alan so should we just jump into our first our first news story sure all right what is it sir yeah uh, sophos the antivirus app uh now detects even more viruses including sophos the antivirus <laughs> app <laughs> yes uh, so earlier this week, Sophos pushed the, the regular scheduled update to the antivirus definition files. Yeah. Uh, the new definitions, however, detected Sophos's updating process and a number of other auto-updating applications as variants of the malware SHH slash uploader B. <laughs> uh, so in addition to setting off a huge volume of false positives and probably scaring lots of people, yeah. the detection also resulted in the quarantine blocking or deletion of parts of the Sophos updater. <laughs> so then they couldn't push out a fix. <laughs> yes. So uh, an updated definition that solves the issue was published on Wednesday, September 19th at 2132 British Standard Time or B British Summer Time. Uh, however, the updated definitions could not be downloaded by many Sof Sophos clients because the updater had been broken by the Sophos update. <laughs> Brilliant. You know, this actually happened to a client of mine uh, with McAfee where the update broke the update functionality and they broke something on Citrix servers and it brought down their whole Citrix farm and it was pretty stressful and yep. you just had to like you couldn't go and of course my first instinct was well I'll go try I'll go get the next update cuz I'm sure they fixed it no nothing mm. so this one they have fixed it and they have a bunch of instructions on how to deal with the issue so but you got to go uh, manually get it from their side it, I would have yeah it's a uh, an especially large issue for enterprise deployments yeah <laughs> where all the clients are supposed to you know check in and and keep getting updates that way uh I don't think it's quite bad enough where you have to like go around to each machine and try to fix it, but it's definitely a lot more headache than the enterprise customers of Sophos really wanted to deal with. Uh, it's, it's, it's the exact kind of mistake that when uh, that antivirus subscription comes up for renewal, that the uh, CTO looks at and then goes, well, there's, uh, there's Nod32, which is one of my favorites. There's, there's Norton. There's a lot of different products out there. Maybe yep. it's time we look at something else because we did have all these problems. Yep. Exactly. And then... Uh, and that enterprise, that enterprise market is where they make all their money. Yes. Uh, and another thing was uh, the so Sophos support phone number uh, was actually down during the incident because they had so many calls that people couldn't even get into the hold queue. Sure, sure. Their, their, you know, their phone system just totally melted down with the number of calls they were getting. <laughs> and you know, if you're an enterprise customer and you're paying a lot for that support in the case of something like this, and then you can't, you phone up and you just get with busy signal or something? Yeah. Not a good impression. No, uh, as a as a tech and if you're if you know you've got people that want answers from you or something like that and you want to provide some kind of status update, sounds silly even if you're not a Twitter user, which I know probably a lot of you aren't uh, you can still go there and read the company's feeds, but the other thing that's really valuable is search.twitter.com and you just search for like a perfect example, before the show started today, uh, I saw well, there was a few people out there reporting Skype issues with the Skype network. So I went onto Twitter and I just searched Skype 
you know, problem. And you come back and you see everybody talking about it. Then you can at least say, well, I see people in this area or that area. And, and, you know, that's the same trick that I pull, like, if I'm somewhere and the Internet goes out. And you have a smartphone, you can jump on your smartphone's connection, go over to Twitter search and see if other people in your area are tweeting about, oh, my God, the freaking Internet just went down. Uh, It's a really good tool for that when you can't get through the support line because it's jammed. I had the uh, same issue, actually, uh, when I was calling uh, the computer store that we buy a lot of our software hardware from. Uh, I was, like, waiting on hold for a very long time, and it was like, you know, the queue wasn't moving very quickly. Uh, And uh, so I went over to their Twitter, and I found out the reason was that uh, the flu was going around, and (laughs) almost their entire support department was out sick. And so... (laughs) They were normally, sharing handsets. Yeah. <laughs> well, normally uh, they have this feature called callback, where if you go to the website, you can request that they call you when it's your turn instead of waiting on hold. But that was marked as close, and I was like, well, what does that mean? Right, right. Does it mean that if I wait on hold, I'm never going to get to the front of the queue? or Probably. Or what? You know, is, is the reason why the queue is moving so slowly is it just waiting until people in front of me give up? <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, but I eventually got it sorted, so... Well, very nice, sir. Any other thoughts on that story? Uh, no, it's just, uh, you know, another thing to have to worry about. I know, right? Uh, well, that's why, that's why the sysadmins out there in the tech uh, world have Sophos a job was still. careful to point out that this only affects the Windows version of their antivirus. Uh, because they said that multiple times, I assume that means that they make antivirus for other yeah, platforms. Yeah, everybody's making antivirus for the Mac now, and I, I think it's silly still. I still don't, and I know people are going to say, oh, that everybody thinks the Mac's perfect. I don't think that. But I just don't, I still don't see it as enough of a trade off where. You know, I mean, I, I'm sure at some point it's going to be a problem where average users are going to need some sort of protection because they're just going to do silly things on their computers, despite Apple's attempts like Gatekeeper and the App Store. I think at some point the Mac's going to need antivirus. I think right now the trade-off in terms of performance impact doesn't justify, or the threat level doesn't justify that trade-off, in my opinion. And so I've noticed a lot of these companies are pushing their Mac products now for antivirus, and I just think it's silly. I had some Mac to well, call... because Mac users are the type of people that are buying it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like Rikai says in the chat room. I mean, you don't. You better have. You better. You'd rather have it before something happens. I. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. It's a tough yeah, call. Although, admittedly, I have never run an antivirus on my personal computer. Yeah. The only time I've ever ran an antivirus on my own machine is if work required it, or if I needed to be able to tell a client, "Yeah, my machine's safe. It's running AV." Right. You know, something yeah. like that. Uh, all right, Alan. Well, before we go on, I'm really excited about today's show. And so I think I just want to put this message out there. If you find today's show valuable, uh, and I think a lot of you will, especially as, as we get to the feedback segment today, just want to remind you that this network runs on your contributions. We don't have a lot of sponsors in our show. And the ones we do have are awesome, but we try to keep it to a minimum. That way we don't have to bombard you guys with this stuff. But the way it works is we have an affiliate system that we rely upon. And if you go to the bottom of jupiterbroadcasting.com, you can find links to our affiliates. And if you click on those links before you shop there, like Amazon, on or Newegg or Think Geek or Best Buy, uh, then uh, you support the network. We also have these extensions, and this is what I, this is great. If you if you want to do this, this is awesome because what it does is Rikai, who's in our chat room right now, has made these extensions so they automatically tag your shopping session whenever you go to one of our participating affiliates. These are also on GitHub too, by the way. So if you want to participate in these, uh, you can find them on GitHub. Uh, and of course, uh, we also at the very top of JupiterBroadcasting.com. We have the donate link. And if you, if you just want to support us directly, not through one of the affiliate programs, but just by directly sending your contribution to us, we can take Amazon or PayPal payments. And uh, we really appreciate everybody who does that because we love creating this content and bringing it to you. And honestly, because it's so technical, because it's so geeky, and because we can say whatever we want to say, that doesn't make it hugely, hugely sellable to an advertiser. And we don't have a big celebrity yeah. name to kind of make up for some of that. You know, we're not Joe Rogan or Leo well, Laporte. Well, for yourself, but... Well, okay, that's true. There is Alan Jude, and Al- <laughs> I mean, hello. I mean, GoDaddy knows, right? GoDaddy's hip. They know what's up. But yep. uh, most people don't, so... Uh, but you guys do. I mean, that's why you guys tune in every single week. So if you can, we really appreciate the support. Uh, of this network. All right, Alan, I think I did enough plugging, and uh, yep. I know that this uh, IE story has just been catching on like wildfire. So tell me what's going on here, because I've yes. only caught mostly the headlines. So earlier this week, uh, researchers discovered a zero-day flaw in Internet Explorer that was actively being exploited in the wild. Uh-huh. Uh, so Internet Explorer version 6 through 9, so pretty much every version, uh, are vulnerable to a series of new attacks. Uh, the first one is an exploit for a previously unknown use after free memory corruption. <laughs> so basically, after uh, Internet Explorer thinks it has freed the memory, 
it is used somewhere else. So in the meantime, it could have been overwritten with something malicious, uh-huh. uh, causing it to uh, run that malicious code. So is this essentially a buffer overflow? Is this? I mean, it's it's similar to, but not the same. In a buffer overflow, you end up writing to an area of memory you didn't think you were using. Yeah. Whereas with a use after free is you thought you erased that memory, that area, or you stopped using it or erased it, and then you end up using it anyway. Oh, so the and system probably considers you've marked it, it as free. Uh-huh. Uh huh. The system isn't protecting it anymore. That's actually worse than. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. uh, it's a little more complicated too. Uh, but yeah, it's IE six, seven, eight, and nine. Although apparently ten is not vulnerable. I don't know if that's because huh. of a major change or. Oh well, yeah. What? Hmm, that's uh, so in addition to that, uh, the next day, three more exploits were found uh, f- that were not the same, uh, but affected the same versions. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, and those three new ones were actually tied to the Chinese hacker group Nitro, uh, that which is the, the same group that was responsible for the two zero-day Java exploits from a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Uh, the ones responsible for exploiting them, not the guys that found them in April. Uh, but th- yeah, so it seems to be the same people. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so security researcher uh, Eric Roman, uh, he's uh, with uh, Rapid7, the guys that make Metasploit. He discovered the first exploit last weekend uh, while he was going over an infected server. Basically, you know, when a machine got infected, he traced it back to the server it came from and was trying to figure out what was going on there. Wow. Uh, so basically, when the user lands on an infected page, the exploit runs, uh, uses that f- uh, use after free exploit, and installs the Poison IV remote access trojan. <laughs> uh, but then the Chinese group, uh, a different researcher from Alien Vault Labs, a different research firm, discovered that the, the Chinese group was using a different trojan called Plug X. Which is also a remote access, uh, remote administration trojan. Hmm. Uh, the other interesting thing is that the new exploits appear to be specifically targeted at defense contractors in the U.S. and India. Uh, le- leading credence to the China theory, likely. Yeah. Uh, sp- specifically, one of the uh, four exploits that was being used was found using an unknown payload on a website for a defense news portal in India. So basically, they specifically targeted a new site for the defense industry and managed to slip their exploit into the code for that page. Because they figured they'd probably be targeting members of that industry, right? right? They'd be visiting... Yeah, the, the people in that industry go to the industry news site. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah. So basically, if you remember back to when um, we talked about WordPress blogs and so on, getting that little bit of code injected into them that makes them install malware on your computer. Yeah. They basically did that to a defense news portal website in India. And then when people visited it, they would get the Trojan installed on their computer if they're using Internet Explorer. Most hmm. people are probably thinking, but nobody uses Internet Explorer. But if you work in a big corporation, <laughs> sometimes you're forced yeah. to use Internet Explorer. That's the thing. That is, that uh, is the And thing. in this case, that is to your detriment. <laughs> Um, and it's interesting, too, because IE9 is, I think, by most people considered a, a, an improvement in terms of security. But here, yet again, we see, I don't know if it's maybe just as a result of IE becoming one of the oldest browsers out there. I mean, you could argue Firefox, I guess. But uh, it just seems like these these vulnerabilities where they affect a, a swath of versions, you know, from, from 9 to 6. So it's like this whole range well, of users. You know, technically, if there was a vulnerability in Firefox, it would likely affect... You know, yeah, version so. three through fifteen. Do we see that happening as much? I guess we do. Um, yeah, although the, they're usually uh, not quite as a big deal. Basically, this one was more important because it was found being used in the wild first, rather than found by a researcher, fixed, and then and never actually exploited. Uh, yeah, it's this interesting. One it was a metasploit researcher. Because, uh, well, the metasploit researcher found the yeah. Sorry, he found the first one. Yes. That's, that's cool. Uh, but that maybe have to do with the fact that Rapid7 may have been contracted to investigate something hinky going on at one of the defense contractors. Oh, I don't know that. I'm just... It just shows you how legitimate the, the MetaSense tool is, is or the yes. MetaSploit tool. Uh, uh, so we'll get to that in a sec. Um, so Microsoft is slated to release an emergency patch tomorrow for this. Although in the meantime, they have what they call it a, a fix-it solution, which is a little file you download and it fixes the problem. <laughs> uh, 
the fix it solutions are for people that need a fix right away and can't wait for Microsoft to finish its regression testing. Right. And so they don't come with the same level of assurance that it won't break everything. Right. That's that is a disclaimer but you should make. If you're under attack or something, you might want the fix it patch in the meantime. Uh, you could also uh, download and install Google Chrome, and that would also mitigate this risk. Yes. Uh, and it, does then, yes. See, it does seem like the justification to require an explorer is becoming harder and harder, right? And especially uh, as Microsoft, I think a is, lot of apps are like the the thing that used to do it was ActiveX applications. Yeah, exactly. But those are really dying off now, and, so. and deprecated in Metro in in uh, in Windows eight. So. Yeah. But like I remember, you know, my aunt was a real estate agent and had the problem all the time. Is like, oh, I have to keep going back to Internet Explorer because, yeah, yeah. you know, this site or that site requires this ActiveX app to actually do my job. Right. Yeah. I know. I know. Uh, but yeah. So Rapid Seven, which is a company behind Metasploit, released a uh, a new Metasploit module that allows you to test for <laughs> and exploit the vulnerability. Love it. Specifically, that's very useful if you're. A, big enterprise and you want to test all your machines and make sure they're not vulnerable to it. Um, so yeah, you guys, if you don't know about Metasploit, you check it out. In fact, um, I did a backtrack review like three weeks ago in the Linux Action Show and I used Metasploit to do a live remote compromise of a system with, a, I think, a vulnerable version of SSH, I think is what I used, and uh, Metasploit is just an awesome tool for that. Awesome. So, I mean, and here you go. It just shows you, I mean, these guys are at the forefront of some of the most interesting security research that's happening in the real world, and they're directly turning around and making a tool out of that that's free. Yep. And Although, I love that. Uh, the company behind it, Rapid7, also makes a paid product that incorporates Metasploit, but has yeah, yeah. other stuff called yeah. NetExpose. Yeah. Uh, it's quite interesting as well. Uh, if I was doing security consulting as a job, I probably would have that in my toolkit, but uh, I'm not, so I don't. <laughs> wasn't worth the money at the time uh, when I was considering it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, any other thoughts on uh, that one, Alan? Uh, not really. I have some links to some additional coverage on it with some more talking about the, you know, the fact that uh, most of the flash files that I use as part of the exploit are named after characters in some video game and all kinds of background information if you actually care. Um, and I think this too, I would not be surprised if down the road we see some big story about some company being compromised because of this type of vulnerability, right? Because they didn't do their patches. This is, you know, this is fairly uh, targeted spear phishing, right? You're going after very specific people yeah. by targeting a site in their industry or, you know, emailing them with, you remember the one a while ago was like a, a fake invitation to a real conference, and it had a PDF file that would exploit your computer? Well, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, it's not quite the same thing because it's not targeted like that, but it's regional. And we've talked about this before where, you know, if attackers compromise a well, news website, yeah. I, had a, I had a rash one day of clients that got infected because the local King 5 news affiliate had malware on their site, and a bunch of my clients would go to the website to check the news. And so I was getting call after call that morning going around having to disinfect PCs because that one website where, a, my, where the majority of my client base would apparently visiting at least someone you know odds were someone in the company was uh and it that sucked yeah. you know and you know that whole idea of compromising a trusted website and putting a, a drive-by zero-day trojan like this on it is you know the nightmare scenario yeah yeah really um all right well why don't we talk about our next story because uh one of the things that uh, i don't think people think a lot about but all of this stuff is it's all connected, like with physical connections. Everything's all piped yes. together, and we don't often get to see behind the scenes on how some of that's done. So this next story reveals some of that, well, doesn't it? A uh, little bit. But basically, this story came to my attention by someone in the chat room, and they were basically asking me if it was true. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, the news story is basically uh, Wired did a piece about uh, the Meet Me Room at One Wilshire, which is a data center in Los Angeles. And then another site, Pingdom, which is a service that does um, website monitoring and stuff. They have some interesting tools as well. Uh, they have an article they wrote about it. Uh, looking at it now, it looks like it's rather old, actually. But um, uh, there was a little bit of confusion over the uh, article. Okay. Uh, and it's basically, it talked about how in the basement of One Wilshire, which is the address, but it's also the name of the building, um, there's this Meet Me Room, which is... Top secret. It's not, but that's what it says in the article, in quotes and everything. <laughs> yeah. um, 
So in a in basically every carrier neutral data center has one of these, and a lot of even carrier specific data centers have them. The general idea is, especially in a carrier neutral data center, is there's lots of different customers renting space throughout the building. Mm-hmm. But if I'm on like the third floor and you're on the fourth floor and we want to connect together, rather than having all of us run cables all over the place willy nilly, uh, everybody's connected to the basement where they then then make connections between the different places. Sure. So basically, everybody runs down to the basement, and then there you have the meet me room where you can meet other people. Uh, and that's basically how different providers connect to each other. Uh, and you know, if the one in Will, one Wilshire had more than two hundred and sixty different uh, providers all connecting together, and they have some impressive pictures of giant bundles of cable and so forth. Right, which I always love. Yes, uh, the falsehood that was in the article seemed that it implied. That, you know, if someone got in there with a pair of scissors or some other type of attack, <laughs> Let, yeah, they could, okay. they could uh, you know, cripple the internet in California or, you know, disconnect uh, foreign countries from the U.S. As like some kind of anti-competitive behavior? More as like a terrorist attack. Oh, okay, okay. Right, not so much with the scissors, but yes. <laughs> well, right? okay, I mean, yeah, that, if it, you bomb a data building, center. The, yeah, the idea that this one building provides the U.S.'s like all of Asia's connections to the U.S. Uh, it's actually not true, though, is the problem. Uh, now, there's a couple of things. Um, so Meet Me Rooms like that are more often used for private peering rather than internet transit. Uh, and so I'll have to explain the difference between the two a little bit. Okay. I'm really kind of dumbing this down, so you'll excuse if it's not 100% accurate. No, I appreciate it. Just that. the easiest way to explain it. Okay. But basically, in internet terms, transit is when you buy internet service from some other provider. And basically, in return, they give you a default gateway that allows you to send traffic to it, and then the ISP is responsible for taking that wherever it needs to go on the internet to get to uh, where you asked it to. Right? So they're basically providing you with a connection to the rest of the world. Right. With peering uh, is when two providers link up at one or more locations and they swap traffic that's only destined to each other. So, you know, provider A will set up peering with provider B, and so when they want to send traffic to each other, instead of going over their paid internet links that they have to pay for, Mm -hmm. they do it over the private link when it's between the two of them, and uh, depending on their agreement... They stay off the toll road, basically. Yeah. Now, depending on their agreement, that peering might not be free. Uh, Sometimes it's settlement-free, meaning both sides agree to just not charge each other. Uh, sometimes I'll have an agreement where, you know, if your end of the deal is at more than this much bigger than mine, then you have to pay me the difference. Mm. Uh, and some of them will have other rules and restrictions. And, you know, the pe- people are free to make whatever contracts they want. But mm-hmm. uh, usually one of the stipulations there is that you're not, if, if I'm provider A and I'm trying to get traffic to provider C, I can't send it over the, my private link to B, right? So that link is only for traffic going to B or B's direct customers. Uh, so a, a lot of those meet me rooms are f- that type, peering, not transit. Uh, although some of it will be transit as well. Uh, so the other thing is that you know the way the internet is designed with uh, BGP or the Border Gateway Protocol mm-hmm. uh, is specifically designed to work around this exact problem. Right, that's what I was going to point out. If you didn't mention that at the end of this, is like this is yes. this kind of thing about this could be routed around. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the internet is based on the principle of being able to get data from point A to point B reliably. That's TCP/IP's job, mm-hmm. and then BGP deals with building the routing tables so that um, now normally people misunderstand. BGP is n- not really designed to find the best route. It finds the route that best matches the ISP's business rules. Okay. Right? So the ISP may take the slightly longer route because it's cheaper. Right. We've talked a little bit about that. And stuff like that. Um, but if that route becomes unavailable, it will then switch to a different one. Okay. Uh, sometimes that takes like two or three minutes, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, usually not that long, but sometimes it doesn't notice right away or whatever. Uh but anyway, so if one Wilshire, which is the building in question, uh, were to go offline completely, like as if some spectacular thing, like every connection in and out of the building was completely severed, mm-hmm. 
the internet would still work. You would still be able to get to pretty much everywhere. Obviously not to the sites that only exist in that data center, but most places. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, maybe you don't take the best route. Yes, performance will likely be degraded because you'll now be taking the second best route. And some of those second best routes may become overloaded because they're not used to dealing with that much traffic. Yeah, you get uh, it. And then, you know, at that point, it might end up going to the third best route and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, the internet wouldn't cease to operate. Uh, and I don't know if you have the show notes here to be able to pull up a couple of these images. Sure. Uh, but basically, I went out to a couple of different uh, major transit providers uh-huh. and pulled up their network maps. And cool. in all of them, you can see the fact that if you were, say, in Seattle and wanted to get to, say, San Diego, normally that traffic would go through Los Angeles. Right. But if Los Angeles ceased to be on the map, there are multiple other paths around Los Angeles to get between Seattle and San Diego. Yeah. Uh, they won't necessarily be as efficient. Like, you know, if they ended up going through, like, Utah or even through, like, Dallas or something. Oh, these are really cool. Yes. Uh, like a specific one you might want to look at is uh, NTTs. Yeah, okay. I got uh, it right here. They have one for, uh, this one shows a little bit more because it's specifically it's for like Asia. It's interactive too. This is awesome. Yes, uh, a couple of them are interactive. Uh, but yeah, the idea with, uh, because theirs goes to Asia, uh, you can kind of see if you zoom in on Los Angeles there, okay. you'll see that their links, while a lot of them go to Los Angeles, a lot of them also go to San Jose. So if the Los Angeles links stop working, they would go around and go to San Jose or up and go to Seattle instead. Yeah, I see that. And connect over one of the other links inside the states to get to where they needed to go. Uh, or you'll, like if you look at the level three one, which is another interactive one, if you zoom in far enough, you see that while there's a whole bunch of different lines that come in from different places in Asia, they actually terminate at all kinds oh, of different places in California. God, this is so cool. Folks, if you're an audio listener, uh, Alan has links to these in the show notes. Check out the level three one if you only look at one. This one is awesome. <laughs> but you can see some of them go to San Jose, some go to Los Angeles, some oh, go yeah. to uh, Palo Alto and so on. So that, you know, if one of those were to be down, the traffic could still get around. It's interesting. Some areas like uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, they really got nothing. Uh, they're, they're mostly served by, you know, the, basically these, these are only the backbone links yeah. on the maps. Yeah. And then the smaller local carriers jump off from these, one or more of these points and then kind of spread out into the individual areas. Wow, and like, it looks like the internet just kind of like avoids like a large portion of New Mexico and Arizona. Like the internet's just like, oh, I'm going to do everything I can to avoid that. Well, it's a desert. <laughs> I don't even think there's any people there. Oh, that's probably what it is. Yeah. All that sand uh, yes. clogs your tubes. Looking at uh, Level 3's map is the I- international links, too. Like, we have uh, some going down to Mexico here. These guys are just connected everywhere, but you were about to mention something about Australia. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the Australian one, it's uh, the bottom link there. You see that even this relatively small ISP that doesn't have links to that many different places, uh, the, even their link to the U.S., there's two different routes. And you can see they're actually interconnected there. Yeah. So, they have links to San Jose and Los Angeles, and then those go to uh, what I'm assuming are like the Marianas or Guam or something. They're not labeled really, and this map isn't to scale, but to Uh, some American (laughs) islands there where they're even cross-connected there. And then uh, those connections then jump off to back to the mainland, but also to the islands. And then there's another link between the mainland and islands so that if one of those cables, which are under the ocean, get cut, because, you know, sometimes a ship's anchor that happens does. to hit exactly the wrong place. Yes. Uh, if one of those cables get cut, they still have a way to get to the U.S. So and there you go. Port. So, so, yeah, even so if you took out the, the Los Angeles node there at One Wilshire, they're not going to uh, suffer at all. So it's maybe a little bit of uh, a link bait, that article. A little bit. Um, but basically, when someone brought it up, I just want to clarify that... Yes, these things exist. No, they're not top secret. There's one in every single data center you've ever been in. Yeah. Uh, and then another thing is like uh, some of the backbones here, like uh, Hurricane Electric, they have their map and they have the list of the addresses. They're not even in that building. They happen to cross connect with a lot of those ISPs at a different building down the street or whatever. Hmm. And so, you know, they wouldn't be affected uh, necessarily at all by an outage at that building. Right, right. But yeah, they're, uh, you know, 
basically the one of the the first sentences in uh, the article at Pingdom is like so much for no single point of failure. Yeah, and it's like the cloud is doomed. Yeah, there there is no real single point of failure. Yeah, even though that building is super redundant uh, and probably has never gone down completely, it wouldn't anyway. Uh, either even if it did, it wouldn't break anything. Yeah. Except for all the people in that building would be very upset. <laughs> yeah, all the customers of, of that provider would be very angry. <laughs> yes, uh, but most times with data centers like that, you know, the fiber comes in through different entrances in, on different sides of the building and so mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. So that even if, you know, a crew doing construction on the road in front of the building accidentally cuts a fiber, there's still other fibers into the building. Yeah. Very well, very well. So, you know... So even if there was an accidental explosion or even a purposeful one outside the building or whatever, it would likely not manage to take out everything. The internet goes on, just like this show, Alan. Uh, any other uh, thoughts on Another that? thing I was going to add was uh, when there was the big tsunami in Japan. Yeah. Uh, it was an interesting... Uh, most, the news about it got buried because it was basically unimportant to anyone except for us, uh, was that the, Japan never lost its connection to the internet. Even though about half of all of their connections were damaged or disrupted or cut, interesting. They still managed to maintain perfect routing to the internet. Hadn't even thought of that. Absolutely right. Hmm. There you go. So, something you, know, you something you just take for granted when it works, but you definitely notice when it doesn't work. Exactly. <laughs> you know. <laughs> All right, Alan. Well, uh, before we move on, I want to take a quick pause here and uh, say thank you to GoDaddy.com for sponsoring this week's episode of TechSnap. And I have got some good news. We've got two great ways for you to save money based on popular demand because people are loving these codes because you can save quite a bit of money and the value is is really there. Uh, so the code that we've gone for this month is five ninety nine tech, and that gets you a .dot com domain for five dollars and. 99 cents, which, come on, I mean, a dot com for $5.99, let's be serious, that's less than a decent app these days, that's insane, that's Mm -hmm. nuts, Um, but if you are like me, and uh, you have domains that are are expiring and need renewal on the 30th, which I have... I have probably eight or nine domains that I'll be renewing uh, by next week. You can use the code or any or any uh, any order that's large. If you've got a lot of stuff you want to do and you just want to take 20% off the top, you just pfft, want to take 20% off, uh, use the code GO20OFF5. They're bringing it back, Alan. We nice. got we got the, we got got enough usage that they said, you know what, people seem to really love this. And it is a great way for people to do renewals or get some hosting or get a whole batch of stuff and then yep. just take 20% right off the top with GO20OFF5. So there you go. Yep. If you're going to get yourself a .com, I think the best route to go for money savings is using our code 599tech 599tech gets but, you the dot you know, com if it's not just for a small project sometimes you end up wanting to have the dot com the dot net yes. the dot co exactly. the dot info the org and, and you know 10 other ones and then your order is big enough you do 20 off instead. Yep. Go 20 off five and uh, just take a take or a- yeah like you said renewals although I did all my renewals last time <laughs> yeah yeah, I got to do that too. I'm now. good to the end of the year now. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, so uh, thank you to GoDaddy for supporting the TechSnap program and bringing these shows to you. You can support this network by supporting our sponsor. Thank you very much, GoDaddy. All right, Alan, with all of that out of the way, I do believe it is time for the TechSnap feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com using our contact form or submitting to the subreddit or some combination of all three. Uh, This week, Alan, we got a big batch. Are you ready for the first question? Yes. Okay. It comes in. I'm going to try to get this right from Alexandre. What do you think? Alexandre. He says, hi, Chris and Alan, or Alan and Chris. Uh, I'd like to say thanks for your awesome show. I watched Last and and TechSnap since its very beginning. I'd also like to mention, just a warning, that I'm from Quebec City, Canada, and that my English isn't my mother tongue, so bear in mind there could be some mistakes in my questions. Uh, Probably not. It's probably just the way I I read things. He's also, uh, he considers himself an intermediary slash advanced Linux guy, and he has a Linux box that he plays with, Debian and Ubuntu, Crunchbang, Arch Linux, and OpenSUSE, all are kind of his, uh, his bag. He goes on to say, I recently bought myself a GoDaddy domain with your awesome code, 599tech. Hey, awesome. Thank you, sir. Uh, I use this domain to point to my home IP address with a dynamic DNS provider. I can SSH to my workstation, as I call it, that's just, you know, so his home desktop, from school without any problems. For that, I forward the port, and uh, he's got a special port, on his uh, DDWRT router, 
which is almost as good as PFSense. And uh, he uh, then uh, he's configured OpenSSH on his server to listen on the port that he's configured on the router uh, mm -hmm. because his ISP blocks SSH. Uh, he says it works great, and it's perfect for when he forgets to bring his machine to work with him or to school. Uh, but now he'd like to get access to some of the other computers on his LAN. He wants to know what would be the best way to go about doing this. I plan to build an own cloud box next summer, and I have other computers that I'd like to get access from the Internet. I thought I could forward other ports on my router, but I find this inconvenient as I need to remember which port goes to which machine. Would a subdomain trick work, like maybe workstation.mydomain.com, like, say, owncloud.mydomain.com, or would something else work? Awaiting your answer is I think I'm not the only one in the situation. Thanks very much, Alexander. Yes. All right, so there's a couple things. Uh, you don't have to change the port that SSH runs on. Most routers will allow you to have uh, a different internal and external port. Yeah. So you can have, you, you know, 25 is blocked by ISP, or if you want to do multiple ones, you're going to have uh, different ports on your outside. Yeah. But then you just say on the inside, you can, change, you can leave it at port 22. Mm -hmm. It depends on your router, but I'm sure w, or, uh, DDWRT will let you do that. That way you don't have to configure each machine separately or when you're on the LAN, try to remember what port SSH is on on each different machine. Yeah. You can leave it on port 22. Yeah. Uh, remotely, no, DNS only does IP address. It doesn't do the port number because uh, that's actually in the OSI model, IP is layer three and port is layer four. DNS only solves the layer three problem. Uh, so no, uh, you can't use a subdomain to differentiate the different ports. You can create special DNS records called SVR records, which have that kind of information, uh, but I don't know of any SSH client that would read those automatically for you anyway. Yeah. Uh, so if you're going to run a bunch, uh, I don't know. Uh, my machines are, well, they all used to have names. Now they all have NATO phonetic alphabet, so it's easy to number them based on their place in the alphabet. Uh, and so I would just increment the ports, right? Now you mm. have machine one, two, three, four, mm. and they can be on port one, two, 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 three, two, two, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Uh, but no, you can't use a subdomain really to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can set up a website somewhere that has the list, and then you can look it up. <laughs> that would be one solution. I suppose so. But he has, you know, he mentions he has a DDWRT router, so uh, he has options like OpenVPN available to him and things like that, too. Yeah, but if you're just out somewhere and you want to SSH into a specific machine, yeah. having to get VPN is a bit more work. What is, Although it is an option. What is your take on services like uh, LogMeIn's Hamachi, which is which is free and will interconnect machines and it takes care of uh, uh, NAT tra transversal and all that kind of stuff? It works. Yeah, on their Linux client is pretty. It's a little garbage balls. now. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, when I, Hamachi was its own thing, it was much better. Now that LogMeIn took it over, I don't like it very much anymore. But it is. It does let you. It lets you establish a essentially a, a back channel network back into your home machine. You Basically, it, it lets you do a VPN without having to understand port forwarding. <laughs> yeah, and it, it and basically they all... uses <clears throat> their mediation server to kind of do what Skype does for calls when the two people are behind yeah. NAT. Yeah. It basically does that for a VPN. Right. So it's very useful. Uh, and the other thing that's neat is like all your machines then are on this IP space. So when you're yes. sitting, uh, in, they all have network is, interfaces you know, that live in the Hamachi network. Yeah. But if you're on, say, a computer in a lab at the college and you want to connect to the uh, second machine well, on your home LAN, yeah. you don't really have the option to solve Hamachi. You got it. You got it. If, it, if it's a client. fixed terminal somewhere, then yes, something like Hamachi or OpenVPN solves your problem very easily. As long as you can load a client, yeah. If you need one, uh, and I th OpenVPN will have a portable client. You can have pre-installed, like on a USB stick. Although you normally need the tap adapter, which requires administrative permissions to install because it's a driver, so that might not be an option. Uh, Mr. Mango in the Actually, chat was recommending TeamViewer as a way to maybe do remote access. Yeah, that's more of a replacement for uh, remote desktop or yeah. VNC. Uh, you would run into the same problem if you have multiple machines. Although I think TeamViewer has a solution for that, kind of like Kamachi, where your machines connect out to TeamViewer and publish your list. But you know, I've had I had the same issue when I wanted to do remote desktop when I was in college. I had two. I had a Windows Server because I was taking Windows Server admin classes, and I had one at home, and then my desktop. And so one ran on like one three three eight nine, and the other one ran on two three three eight nine. Three three eight nine is the so default AP port, it and. It would just solve it that way. Well, if we look at it from so if it's already if he can already SSH to his home machine, we know he's whatever his workflows that's capable. What about doing something like uh, 
uh, free NX into his home machine and then just browsing from that machine and then he's living there? Or what about doing something like uh, SSH tunneling, something like that? Well, um, uh, I think from his question, he only wanted to just be able to SSH directly into one machine. Uh, so obviously he has the option of SSH into the first and then from there SSH over the LAN to the second. Uh, and you get you know into the recursive shells and so on. Yeah, yeah, I do uh, that all the time. <laughs> my friend Phil, what he does is he has a screen or Tmux or whatever set up with a different thing with an SSH session open to every one of his servers. So he just connects to his main server, and then he's got already open sessions to every one of his servers. Oh, really? Yeah. Although that works for him because he has like five. Doesn't work for me because I have like seventy. <laughs> right. Hmm. <laughs> So uh, there's a few, a few options there, but yeah, c- it kind of depends on what the end client that he'll be sitting at can support. Yeah, but basically DNS cannot solve that problem. No, not DNS. A, a lot of people were looking for something like that when, you know, their ISP blocks port 80 or 443, and they want to run a web server at home, so they put it on like port 81, but then there's no way in DNS to, say, use port 81. Right. Uh, sometimes you can cheat if you have like a forwarder. If your domain's at GoDaddy, you can set up URL forwarding. Uh, yep, yep, like, yep. Like you have JB Live does that. Yep, JB Live TV and JB Live info are just DNS forwarders that I set up at GoDaddy. Well, they're not DNS forwarders though. They're HTTP forwarders. So the the IP address that they resolve to is actually GoDaddy. Yeah. And GoDaddy server does an HTTP oh, redirect. Right. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. I guess. And then and that. so you could use that and then redirect to the port, but that doesn't work for SSH. No. No. Uh, no. So yeah, there's. The best solution is to forward multiple ports and do so in such a way that you can remember which one's which. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, That's what I'm doing. so and I'd be curious too, Alexander. So let us know uh, what you end up, what works for you, or if anybody has some suggestions, it'd be great to start a thread in the TechSnap subreddit to uh, get those going. All right, Alan. This next one is uh, should be an interesting question for some folks out there. It comes in from Sean. He says thanks for says thanks for answering one of my previous questions about Linux in a FreeBSD jail. I remember that one. Uh, the whole concept is pretty epic, and I can't wait to have an excuse to try it out. Now, this question, however, spawns some flame wars at work and on a couple of forms, but I haven't gotten a very good answer. So here it goes. What's the technical difference between PF and IP tables? As far as I can tell, they're both kernel-level systems that manage packets. They both support pre- and post-routing manipulation and generally work pretty fast. So what would make one better than the other. I think the problem is that I can't find anyone who knows enough about both of them to make an intelligent judgment. So I turn it over to the professor and the admin. Thanks again for creating so much great content. Just got the affiliate extension set up on my wife's computer. She'll now be supporting you guys without even knowing it. <laughs> Being as all my money goes to Amazon, you guys might see a little bump in proceeds. Thanks again, and please keep up the great work. Well, thank you, Sean. That's, that's very funny. Um, Alan, do you have any uh, any gut? I'm sure you're gonna you're probably gonna go with PF on this, right? Yes. Now, I, basically, I learned IP filter, which is a predecessor to PF, and IP tables both while I was in college. Uh, the thing that struck me as the biggest difference is the ease of administration. Uh, for example, in IP tables, a rule to allow you know port 22 allow connections into port 22 from a specific. Um, Subnet in your LAN, for example, yeah, would be like IP tables minus capital A input minus I ETH zero minus P TCP minus S uh, the subnet minus minus D port twenty two. It's this kind of mess of of gibberish and switches. Whereas PF is almost natural language. It would be like pass in on ETH zero from one nine two one six eight whatever to port 22 established or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's a lot closer to English and it's just a lot easier to write. That's my experience as well. Is uh, and, and PF... I just uh, Basically, I just found IP tables repulsive in the fact that you'd have to go back to the manual every time you wanted to write a rule because you can't remember all those silly switches. And I, I just... I'm not a big fan of switching back and forth between the single dash and a letter and the double dash and a word. Uh, it's like I would either use all one or the other. Yeah. Uh, and... You know, almost I prefer the longer ones because it means when you're reading the already written thing, you can tell what it's saying. Yep, yep. Uh, and that's so nice, especially when you're under the gun. <laughs> yes, or when you're reading someone else's firewall rules. Oh, yeah. It's when nice you, yep. if it says, you know, minus minus source blah instead of just minus S. 
It's like, well, what does uh, S stand for? I've used IP tables a lot. I've used it in production a lot. And I've used PF uh, in, in a little one step removed, more so in PF Sense implementations, uh, which is where PF Sense obviously gets its name. Um, the reason why I actually tried out PF Sense is the bank that I worked for had these very, very expensive Solaris. Um, oh, gosh, Alan, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. I admin the box for two years. But it's a very expensive firewall vendor, proprietary solution. It's like $11,000 just for their hardware box, and that's their base model without any VPN accelerator cards. And uh, I, I, what I discovered when I watched them reload one of the boxes after it had died one day is that their firewall is just using PF. This $11,000 corporate firewall that, by the way, that was the entry model unit, uh, <laughs> was all just sitting on top of PF. And I, th I thought that, I, th I just thought, this is something I have to check out. And that was how I discovered. So I initially had started using IP tables. And I think it's fine. Um, you know, I, I think I've had to uh, memorize the IP tables flush command a little too many times tr during troubleshooting and things like that. But PF Sense always really, really impressed me. Um, gosh, I can't believe I'm blanking on that, on that firewall. They're like the the biggest firewall proprietary vendor out there, and I'm just totally forgetting what their name is. Um, all right, Alan, it's not Cisco. Uh, all right, so, uh, Alan, the next question comes in from Avid, and uh, he's, uh, he's written in before, so we got two repeats, and Avid says, uh, hello, and I know how lo Chris loves butchering my name. You are correct, Avid. And uh, he see, oh, uh, uh, Avid, uh, Avid, A-V-I, uh, Avid. It, Juniper, no, uh, was it Juniper? No, but no, it was not Jupiter. It was it was close to Juniper. Uh, <laughs> we had Juniper firewalls too. He says, I, I rewatched the NGINX versus Apache episode in ep you know, episode 39, and I still have a question after watching that. Uh, what, we're, what we're trying to accomplish uh, is expose our application servers, which use Tomcat, to the public internet. Each Tomcat server runs a different service and should be accessed using a different URL. We want to have communication happen over SSL and be supplied from the front-end web server, despite the fact that the back-end application servers will be using regular HTTP. We know that Apache can do what we need in this case. With that said, we'd like to know if Nginx could perform this job, and if so, which solution might be considered more secure? Thanks in advance for any reply. And he says, by the way, I'm still do donating torrent bandwidth. Thank you. We don't mention the TechSnap torrents often enough, but thank you, everybody, who does yes, that. Yes, if you download via the torrent, it saves Chris money. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like donating. Although it costs Alan revenue, so it's a give and take. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, actually, Alan's very nice. I'm sure we almost get that at cost, practically. But Alan, yep. what do you think? Is this something Apache could have? Um, Apache I mean, can kind of do it, but Nginx will do it so much better, faster, and more scalable. Uh, so yeah, basically, you can configure Nginx uh, to... Listen on SSL. Uh, its backend connections are always HTTP uh, 1.0. No keep alive, no SSL, nothing in there because it's designed for speed, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it'll, it'll let you listen on SSL externally, have different rules uh, or what they're called location blocks in um, Nginx so that each different like subdirectory or whatever uh, in your URL, however you break it down, can point to a different backend proxy or different backend, so that way you can have your different apps installed in basically what looks like subfolders, yeah. but each one's actually going to a different server. I Actually, it's a solution I recommend for people when they want to run, uh, if, if, for example, uh, the guy that has the, uh, the problem with the SSH, uh, somebody else has had that problem where they have two different web servers at their house, but they only have one public IP address. Mm -hmm. How do they let both websites work? Right. But if you put Nginx on the router, like if you're using PFSense, or uh, basically you point every your IP's port 80 to one Nginx, then let Nginx decide which website uh, to point it to internally. Yeah. Using you know Apache virtual hosting type thing where you switch the name based on the, the host header, you know based on the name of the website, or you can do subdirectories. But yeah, so Nginx will reverse proxy to your Tomcats, uh, and it will provide the front end SSL. It has more concurrency and Basically, Nginx with a couple of threads can manage 10,000 concurrent connections to your website, like Very all nice. open at once. Wow. In less than 10 megabytes of RAM. Maybe a little bit more if you're using SSL. In Apache, each connection to your website is going to use at least 10 megabytes of RAM. Yeah, seriously. Even if it's just doing a proxy. So Nginx is really awesome. Also, Nginx can do things like... Uh, you can have it set so that if you have two Tomcat backends for the same site, it can balance the load between them or use the second one only in the case where the first one's down. And you can configure that, like say, 
you know, if you get so many errors within this many minutes, consider it down and don't give it any more traffic again for X minutes or whatever. It's very flexible, lets you specify everything. Hmm. You can also have Nginx do some caching. Uh, you know, if the result is always the same for a certain request, you can have it store that on disk on the Nginx machine and not even bother Tomcat. Ah, very nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, you know, a lot of times uh, if you're just having, if you need Apache for some reason, you can speed up Apache just by putting Nginx in front of it and having Nginx uh, maybe cache or statically serve the images. Hmm. God, Nginx is so awesome. It is. Yeah, and uh, there you go. Hopefully that'll help him uh, settle that. And I'd be curious yes. to know if uh, they go with it. Yeah, uh, I would recommend it a much more highly than Apache. All right. Uh, even just for the SSL stuff, you get a lo- it's a lot easier to configure things like the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the cipher suites that you want to use and stuff. It's just, uh, it's honestly documented better in Nginx and Apache, which is actually quite strange because Apache has excellent documentation. And been around for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, uh, why don't we do our next email then? It comes in uh, from Mike, and uh, this one's interesting. It's about setting up a system where they can move sensitive documents around. And now, we don't have all the details, but we're going to give it our best shot. He says, hey, guys, huge fan of both TechSnap and LASS. Man, these people who write this also need to check out Coder Radio because the three shows go really well together. Uh, mm-hmm. I have a question that I thought would be interesting to hear your thoughts on on one of your shows. I work as an IT consultant, and I've recently been talking uh, uh, tasked with setting up a system where sensitive documents can be moved securely to an encrypted machine. The employees will use different computers... Uh, located in the same room to write the documents, and then they will then afterwards be moved to an encrypted computer. Here's just some things to remember. Neither machine will ever be connected to the Internet ever. The documents should be preferably written in Microsoft Word. And the third uh, thing to remember is neither machine will ever leave the office. So there you have it. As I said, the documents are rather sensitive. Security is vital, and I would like your feedback on how this could be best done. I have some ideas of my own, but I would very much appreciate your input on what might the best model be. Best wishes, Mike. Hmm. So security is critical. Yes, and in which case it seems odd that the computer they write them on wouldn't have encryption. Yeah, why not? Yeah, why, why wait to encrypt them until they reach their final destination? Yeah, um, uh, so you should probably... Even though I don't trust the Microsoft encryption, I would turn it on, maybe. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Even, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a little uh, something. Specifically, the one you have to worry about, especially with Microsoft Word or even using like LibreOffice, is that it keeps a temporary version of the file as well. Yes. Right? Yes. So you have, there basically there's two copies of the file, the main one and the temporary one. Yeah. And you want to make sure that that temporary one is encrypted on the local computer as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's something that comes up when you look at using the uh, encrypted folders option in Windows. I don't remember all the specifics because I remember specifically bringing it up when I taught the class yeah. on Microsoft uh, Server Administration and about you know temporary files when you're dealing with encryption. Yeah, but that's the reason why Microsoft Office changed to write the temporary files to the same directory as the original uh-huh. instead of to your the global temp directory. Uh huh. Is so that if the file was stored somewhere encrypted, that the temporary file would be as well. So uh, I see, you know, uh, Dandy Patty in the chat room is recommending something. Like he didn't say. So one, a couple of details Mike left out is I'm assuming the machines and the machine that'll store them are are, are networked on a LAN. Uh, he didn't say what OS the machine will be storing them in. If it's a Unix Linux machine, uh, something like rsync and maybe SSH running on the end of a machine, something like that would be a secure way to transfer them over the For land. For some reason, I had the idea these machines weren't networked at all and that they were like, you know, carrying things with like a USB stick. I don't maybe. know. I, I was just thinking like 50 style for some reason because of the way he was describing yeah, it. Yeah, me too. I, so I'm not quite sure. But uh, So I was like I was like all sneaker net. <laughs> I'm sure Mike knows about TrueCrypt. Uh, I would say that's something to look into for like the for the USB yeah. storage. Uh, yeah, basically a TrueCrypt volume. Yeah. Um, Honestly, if I was going to make a recommendation, I think I uh, look at the temporary files. Yes, uh, mine would be don't do it manually. Uh, don't yeah. do it. Don't don't make it up to the users. That'll be your number one. Because they will start point. taking shortcuts, and then yeah. they'll the mess it up. They won't, won't follow get, procedures. Uh, they'll forget passphrases. They won't unmount and mount the encrypted volumes properly. 
it will be a mess. Automate that process. Uh, so I got to say, go with LAN and, and just don't connect that LAN to the internet and uh, look at something like uh, R-Sync or... Um, uh, what, what what would be a good uh, transfer? You know, if if the end machine was if the storage machine was running Linux or, or FreeBSD, they could use something like WinSCP from the client machine to transfer to the yeah, server. or FileZilla. Yep. Or uh, actually, um, Putty makes command line uh, things if you want to script you it or something. Batch it and they just say, all right, put them in this there's folder like, and then run this batch. There's like file. Uh, PSCP yeah. and yeah. so on. Uh, that really automates it, right? Because you just say, okay, yeah. once that once everything's in the once everything's in the folder, and then that batch, you could write that batch script and verify that it properly deletes the files and cleans everything up afterwards too. Yeah, uh, something you might want to look at is Microsoft makes a tool. I think it's called Scrypt. It's uh, a tool specifically for preparing a drive before you enable Microsoft's encryption, and it can. It basically goes through all the slack sectors on the hard drive, the places where their deleted what's, data has already called? been deleted. What's I think it, it was S-Crypt. I forget what it's called. I'm going to look that up. That sounds uh, awesome. But basically it allows you to zero out the slack space that's not used on your hard drive. So anything that's not a file, all the uh, basically the space where a file was there but was deleted can be over right. with zeros. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, yeah. And that may be uh, That's useful. probably worth looking at. Yeah, there you go. All right. So good luck, Mike. Uh, okay, Alan, we've got a couple more questions. Like I said, big feedback segment. A couple more questions. This one is interesting. Interesting. It's another versus. Arthur writes in and he says, I follow Lass and TechSnap. Insert code of radio there and you got me. Uh, I'm a senior systems admin of a Red Hat Enterprise Linux box uh, network at a railroad company, and I have my RH CSA. I was a former VMS system admin until about five years ago. My question is this. I want to use an extra computer I have built as a NAS. And I was wondering if maybe on TechSnap you might mention the pros and cons of free NAS versus open filer. I know one is based on FreeBSD and one is based on Linux, but both use web interfaces for control. And I'm wondering if a Red Hat Enterprise Linux admin uh, with, a, with an EE background uh, and someone who's assembled several computers so he's comfortable building machines uh, wouldn't be better off going with something like uh, open filer. Uh, so he goes on to say that uh, he says OpenFiler does lack in some areas, but he's more comfortable with Linux. Thanks for the great show, Arthur. Um, part of the point of FreeNAS is that you probably don't ever have to poke the FreeBSD part of it. Yeah, you really shouldn't, as I've learned. Right, yes. Uh, basically, you know, when it's an appliance, it's meant to be used as an appliance. Yeah. So when you start poking it manually is when you start breaking things. I would say OpenFiler is a lot like that too, though. Yes. Uh Honestly, because FreeNAS has ZFS and OpenFiler does not, yeah. I would go FreeNAS. Um, but admittedly, the one of the main reasons I would go with FreeNAS is because of my experience with FreeBSD and knowing that I could pair it apart manually if something if went completely wrong and I yeah. needed to get everything back. Right. Uh, so I can understand why you might want OpenFiler. Um, but really, look at features, uh, you know, you can build FreeNAS. Uh, you can put FreeNAS yourself on anything. You, That's like, the way to go, right? Just, just test. You can download both of them for free. Yeah. And uh, just uh, try it out. Now, OpenFiler, I believe, has, uh, has, has a kind of a more of a, a, a commercial system side to it where you can get like paid plugins and stuff like that. The FreeNAS right, plugin uh, situation... FreeNAS is free, and yeah. the company behind it has a separate product called TrueNAS, which is uh, their paid version. Right. Uh, FreeNAS also has the PBI system available to it, although it's pretty, pretty small. If you the way you find PBIs it's for FreeNAS getting is, better. Y- yeah, uh, yeah. Basically, PCBSD has has really advanced PBIs in the last couple versions. Uh, FreeNAS just has to catch up. And and so it's it's usable, but like uh, if you want to find like say, uh, Sam Sabin ZBD or uh, you know, Couch Potato or whatever it might be that you want to get sick beard, you can find. Uh, P, uh, you can find PBIs to get those loaded, but you got to go troll the free NAS forums and stuff. I I went free NAS myself. I looked at this, these options. I made the choice to go free NAS because I wanted to use ZFS and I wanted some of the other features. Plus, uh, I think the free NAS UI is a little a little better. Um, they've they've recently added some nice features to it that I think are quite nice. And free NAS has a really strong track. That said, I really don't have a lot of experience with OpenFiler directly. At the end of the day, they're both yeah, Samba NFS servers, and when you just use the web interface. There's not a huge amount of difference. The only reason you'd really want to try to make the, tr- the call between the two is if you are going to play under the hood. And if you are going to do that, I don't know why you wouldn't just build your own Fedora box. 
and just throw Samba on there, to be honest with you. If, uh, if that's what I would do instead of going with OpenFiler. If you wanted to go with OpenFiler because you want to use Linux, then use Linux. Right? Yeah. Otherwise, go free NAS and get the benefits of a free BSD box that you don't have to mess with very much. And honestly, you're not really supposed to go around playing with the plumbing anyways. So uh, that, would be my, that would be my suggestion. Okay, Alan? Yep, I found the tool we were talking about a second ago. It's called oh. sdelete, not sscript. Sorry. Sdelete, folks. Check that yes. one out. Uh, it's on the Microsoft Technic. It's written by Mark Rusinovich, who we've talked about before as like the guy that didn't work for Microsoft that knew more about Windows than anyone at Microsoft <laughs> and now works at Microsoft. Yeah, in fact, uh, he was just interviewed on Windows Weekly uh, today. I was watching a little bit of that before uh, the show cool. started. But yeah, if you use it with the minus C switch, it will uh, basically do a secure erase on only the free space on your hard drive. So it won't touch any of your files, but all the slack space, anything you've deleted, will get overwritten properly. Uh, so okay. that's something you might want to consider on a computer where you want to wipe out those temp files more securely. All right, Alan, it's just our last few emails here. This one came from John, and, you know, I bet other people have had this common misconception before, so I think it's good we get a chance to clear it up. We, I never would have even crossed my mind if we hadn't gotten an email about this. So yep. he writes, uh, I've been listening to the show for about a year now, and each time you talk about cracking passwords, I always wonder, how is this done when many systems will lock the account out after a few failed attempts? Please, could you explain how this is done without locking out the accounts? Thanks for the great show, John. Right. There is the misconception between the idea of cracking a password and the idea of brute forcing a password. Right. I guess even then, it's not quite the same. Basically, it's an online versus an offline attack. Yeah. In an online attack, you're attempting to log into the account, and the other side can see that you're doing this and will lock you out after a couple of attempts, mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. Although some systems don't. Uh, Twitter was famous for their admin <laughs> section, didn't lock out, and so somebody just Oops. tried for months at a time until they finally got in. <laughs> Uh, but Jeez. yes, most <laughs> systems, if you do an online attack against them, will lock you out. <laughs> so what we see instead is with, for example, the leak from uh, LinkedIn, is someone got in and got a copy of the entire password database. Yeah. And then now, they just sit there offline and pluck away. Had, that database had hashed passwords so that people's passwords weren't obvious at the time. But you got all by, the time in the world. The database is just sitting there yes, on your hard with drive. with an offline attack, you basically just keep... Try get, making guesses until you find one that matches the same encrypted or not encrypted hashed string, uh, and then you know that password will let you into that system. Yeah, it's not even guaranteed that the password that you guess that comes out to the same hash will actually be the password the person used. Although it's fairly likely because you know the only a certain percent of the possible strings are passwords or yeah. usable passwords. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, your rainbow tables. Uh, allow you to do that much quicker because basically a rainbow table is computed all the hashes ahead of time so that when you end up crack, trying to crack 10,000 different passwords, you don't have to try each word 10,000 times. You try them once, you write it down, and then you use a lookup next time instead. But if the passwords are stored properly with what's called a cryptographic hash, where basically there's a salt that goes in front of it, it makes the same password hashed five times will come up with five different results because it has five different salts, then you would need a separate rainbow table for every possible salt, mm. and there are usually enough of those to make that impractical. Mm. So, yeah, there you go. So, that's so basically, by doing an offline attack, I think we talked about it a little bit before. For example, if you can get physical access to a Windows machine, you could boot it off a live CD or something and steal the SAM database, the local account database. Well, on most, most Linux boxes, if you get root access yep. locally, you, or if you get local access, you can boot in single user mode and change the root password. Yes, have now, at it. There's, there's a simple way to lock that out by changing your, uh, your TTYs file uh, or your init tab, depending on the Linux or whatever. But even if you have that, if someone can turn the computer off, boot off a live CD and clone your hard drive, or you know, mount the file system and take it, then they could have that file. Yeah. So what you often see happen there is instead of standing at the console trying passwords until they run out of time, because you know a lot of those systems also have a, a exponential uh, delay, so that you know after you fail three passwords, it doesn't give you a prompt again for sixty seconds. It makes you sit there and wait to slow down an attack like that. Um, if you can get physical access to the uh, hashed password database, you make a copy of it and you leave, right? Mm -hmm. And you do an offline attack against it, maybe for maybe it takes a couple of months, but then you find out what the password was. Then you walk back, 
type it into the console and you have room. Right. You can be totally leisurely about it because you've had yes. plenty of time offline. Now, that's why companies had the policy of forcing you to change your password every so many months or, you know, one month or three months or whatever. So that by time someone had enough time to try to crack your password, when they came back, your password will have changed in the meantime. And they'll hopefully never be able to crack your password quickly enough to be inside that window. Right. Hmm. But yes, uh, that's the main difference. Is the, basically the difference between an online attack, which can be detected, and an offline attack. Although an offline attack requires somehow getting a copy of the password database, even in its hashed form, and then brute forcing it. There you go. So if you can deny people access to the hashed passwords, then their only choice is the online attack, which you can quickly detect and block. So uh, thank you to John for sending that question and give us a chance to actually address that because it's I can see how people yes, could have a misunderstanding. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, so the next uh, next one comes in. It's from the TechSnap subreddit. DBT816 submits it, and he says, I don't know if you guys noticed this, PFSense 2.1 is out soon, and Alan, they say it's going to be on, uh, they say it's going to be announced uh, or unveiled at EuroBSDCon 2012. There we go. On so October yeah, 18th. Uh, yeah. That's less than a month away. So you're going to get to see it firsthand. You're going to be one of the first people to see it. Although That's if you want to really see cool. a preview, there's a video from their presentation at BSD Can in the spring. It's on uh, the BSD Can YouTube channel. Next email comes in from Emmett, and he just wants to he just wants to shake his head in shame. Uh, and he said, yeah, I think he even has the, yeah, he, he recommends the go to Hall of Shame. We might want to do that. So uh, Emmett wrote, wrote in, he said, the Dell voice powered by Fongo, I think that's how you say it, Fongo, is storing passwords in plain text. I did have forgot my password today, and they sent me the old password in his email. This service holds people's credit cards and numbers like pers- credit cards and other personal info. I vote them for the Hall of Shame. What is Fongo anyway? I don't, it's some sort of voice service. So uh, the Hall of Shame, we had a Hall of Shame submitter that now, I'll have to... Uh, there could be an issue here. Um, oh, okay. Well, no. Uh, so if this service is storing your credit card numbers or something, then it has to store the number in such a way that it can get the number back in order for you to use it somewhere. The credit card, yeah. Yeah. Uh, although, yes, your password to access that should be hashed properly. Mm-hmm. And they shouldn't be storing that in plain text. But uh, it came up the other day, and I think it was a chat room or something. We were talking about how you have to store the password uh, for some stuff in a config file. And it's like, well, why don't you hash it when you store it in the config file? So someone reading the config file can't find out your password. But the problem there is that the application is actually using that password to log into something. Mm-hmm. And so it needs the password in the plain text version in order to be able to log in. Right. Uh, so that's why, for example, we talked about the password store in your Firefox. Like if you use Firefox yeah, yeah, or Chrome yeah. or whatever, yeah. and you have it remember your passwords for sites, it has to store those in either plain text or in some encrypted form where the key is a master password. Uh, but it has to be a reversible encryption. You can't use a hash to remember your password for Gmail or something because the whole point of a hash is this one way you can't get the original password back and if you can't get the original password back, you can't use it to log into Gmail. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it does seem that, yes, the service should not do that. So if uh, you want to get something in the Hall of Shame, uh, submit it to the TechSnap subreddit and then get folks to vote it up. It's got to get at least 10 votes to reach the Hall of Shame. I think we have one for next week. Uh, Alan, this last one I love because uh, it was sent in by Anonymous, but he put it on Slexi.org himself, and then he submitted it to the TechSnap subreddit himself. So this guy totally knew how to make sure he got in this week's episode. Uh, he says, hi, guys. Love the show. I've been a Chrome extension and a subscriber. Thank you very much, Anonymous. And it uh, was awesome to see my Bash script in one of the finales the other week on last. So close to being a winner. Oh, I wonder which one it was. So while uh, the BSD king is away, this, by the way, is a suggestion for TechSnap80 when you're gone. It seems only fitting that BSD love continue and we get to learn something. There has been heaps and props of mentions of to PF Sense, and uh, now as a result, uh, I run it uh, at home and uh, it keeps the baddies away and Squid saves my bandwidth and blocks things that I prefer the kids don't see. I love it. It's awesome. However, it's running on a laptop that could easily handle a little more work. And as it's on all the time, it would be good to utilize it. I had to utilize all that electricity. So I got to thinking what else it could do. The first things that pop in my head are it could be a torrent client for all the awesome Jupiter broadcasting content. It could be a Pixie server so that I can fix my broken Linux boxes when I got one to tweak uh, without having to leave uh, my couch. <laughs> That's funny. Or it could be a Samba server. So I've done all these things in Linux, but uh, when I look at a generic PSD guides on BSD guides online, some of them, some of the commands don't work. Is there something I'm missing? Is PFSense a special case? Is there a 
is there a place to find more packages that are listed in the PFSense web than what are listed in the PFSense web GUI? So many questions. Linux is the best rabbit hole I have fallen into. I just wish I had more time. Cheers again, guys. Keep up the awesome work. Uh, so, Alan, sounds like he's trying to load uh, some of this extra stuff on his PFSense box, and they don't have uh, packages in the PFSense GUI for it. I'm sure they would have one for Samba. You would think so, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't use PFSense all that much. Uh, like, the few times I've used it, it's just been as a router firewall kind of dedicated. Um, yeah, yeah. It's probably, you know, I haven't played around under the hood a lot. Uh, now, yeah, um, it's probably missing some of the basic tools because it's a minimal Some install. stuff has changed. Like that. Also, the config system is entirely changed. The entire configuration for PFSense is actually done with PHP and XML files rather than the regular bsdrc.conf stuff so that it's easier for their web interface to modify it. If it's an XML file, it, you know, it's a lot easier to modify values in an XML file than it is to try to do that in a shell script yeah. that is the rc.conf. Yeah. Um, what do you think so about? Would it be? Crazy? I guess even if, if you basically if you manage to get the regular BSD version of Samba installed, I don't think the startup script would work properly. Would and it be so crazy if he kind of flipped things around? He took that laptop and say he put another OS on there as the base OS, and then virtualized his PFSense machine. You could do that. Basically, the route I took was instead of using PFSense, I just installed real FreeBSD on the machine <clears throat> and set up the NAT and. Uh, DHCP myself. Right, right. Partly because you learn more that way. Yeah. Uh, and yes. partly because I mostly wanted it as a file server and the routing was just an extra. And in his case, the guides would be more applicable, which would be helpful. Yep. Um, so that's something to think about. Or, or go Linux. You know, go Linux, yep. put PFSense in a VM, and then do all your fun stuff uh, with the stuff you know how to do. Either way, yes. it's going to be a good uh, box. At one point in the past, my old file server, the one that's being phased out, uh, was actually a Windows machine, mostly because it was also my media center. Mm. Uh, and then it ran FreeBSD in uh, VMware server at the time, but would be VirtualBox now, um, and would basically virtualize my router on top of a Windows machine. Uh, and then eventually, the hard drive that had Windows on it died, and I switched the machine to FreeBSD natively instead. Uh, and now but, you're a happy boy. Yeah, and then and then I eventually replaced the NTFS partitions with UFS because the NTFS was being annoying. Uh, it would have problems, especially when you got down to where you were, you used up almost all the free space, and you're running into the reservation for the um, MFS or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I eventually replaced all that with ZFS. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but with no redundancy, and then I replaced that entire thing with the new fancy array with redundancy and three terabyte drives. Oh, this is very nice. This is very you can't nice. see, but I'm petting the server right now. Yeah. <laughs> Alan, uh, we actually have something, two really cool things that are going on in the TechSnap audience this week that uh, we wanted to mention on the show before we jump out of feedback. First up, a longtime fan of TechSnap, is, he goes by links in the chat room from time to time, uh, or illusionist links, depending on where he's logged in at. Uh, he's used math and other really cool uh, techniques to create some music, and he just wanted, I just wanted, he wanted me to mention it, and I wanted to because he's a Longtime fan, he's a supporter of the network. He he's an Amazon subscriber, and I thought, you know, I, I want to give back to the community when we can. And so he's mm -hmm. got uh, go to music.illusionistlinks.net, or we'll have a link in the chat room. It's pay for what you want music, and it's good ambient, like working music where you're trying to concentrate and you want a little something in the background. It's perfect for that. Pay what you want, and uh, if you buy it with PayPal or you send him an email and say, hey, I heard about this on TechSnap, he's actually going to donate the proceeds to Jupiter Broadcasting. Which is really cool oh, too. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So go check it out. It's it's really cool stuff. Uh, it's a it's a Bandcamp website, so it's it's you know a standardized platform, and uh, it's sort of like the humble bundle where you just set the amount and and you pay it. So that's uh, music.illusionistlinks.net. Link in the show notes for links is music. And congrats to him. He's really excited. So that's awesome. And then Alan. This one's really cool, yep. and Scale Engine's involved, too, which is really awesome. Yep. Uh, Nicholas, viewer Nicholas, uh, needs the audience's help. He is going to ask his girlfriend to marry him on a live stream, streaming through Scale Engine, 
that uh, Alan has been nice enough to provide, and uh, he needs help getting the girlfriend in on it because she doesn't know yet. So he'll be submitting links to our subreddits to try to get people to spam her. And he's got a website, rachelwillyoumarryme.com. Rachelwillyoumarryme.com. It, it, it'd be live Friday. I think it's 6 p.m. Pacific. He didn't tell me the time zone. Uh, but anyway, so there's a countdown on the website. Exactly. He's got a countdown on the website. That's all that you need Chris's to know. That was Chris's contribution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You like that? That was my contribution, and the mentioning it on the shows. Uh, yeah. So uh, he he's got it's. He's got a really cool website where he's going to propose to her in one day and 25 minutes as of this recording, and he's going to be doing it live from this restaurant, and he wants he wants people to show up about an hour before the event starts. That's why the account is handy, because then he's going to organize the audience. Jupiter Broadcasting fans getting married in a very, very geeky way, and I think it'd be really cool if you guys could help him out. He's really looking forward to this. He's very excited. Yeah, so basically his plan is to spam his girlfriend with yeah. the, uh, <clears throat> basically... Email, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, uh, bit.ly shortened versions of the URL so that she doesn't know what it is until she clicks on it. Yeah. Uh, and basically you have hundreds and hundreds of people, be, you know, Twittering and, and Facebooking and so on, telling her to go to the URL. Yeah. And then when she finally does, because at that point she'd be like, what the hell is this? Right. Or think she's under attack by spam bots. <laughs> How cool is that? Um, Plus, I'm sure you got RachelWillYouMarryMe.com with a GoDaddy promo code. Yes. Right, right. Hopefully so. our... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and yes, and so uh, he contacted Scale Engine and we set up the live streaming so for him. That's really uh, cool. And it's all ready to go. So very exciting. Rachel, will you marry me? dot com is where you can find that. It'll be on Friday. Just go there and you'll have a countdown at the top of the website if you want to help him get involved and just want to help out a community member. Hey, it's it's good that one of uh, one of the members in our audience is getting married too. So congratulations to him. Yes. Uh, so uh, check it out. Uh, we have links to all of that in the show notes. Uh, also, uh, Illusionist links is music which is really neat. And just a reminder, uh, you can have some fun if you want to help us out. Uh, submit your uh, stories that, uh, or uh, submit your suggestions for things that newbies in the industry should know when they come in. Things that like you're surprised they didn't learn in school, they didn't pick up online or something like that. Let us know. We have a thread linked in the show notes or you could email us techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. What do you wish those rookies knew? We'll be covering that in episode 80 when we when we tape ahead. We've also got uh, a link in there where you can suggest news headlines that will happen the week that Alan's out that we won't be able to talk about. And I think we might write a few of those in episode 82. So yes, uh, basically episode 80 will be recorded early on before episode 79. So there won't actually be an episode where I'm not here. It'll just, uh, yeah. And we won't be live that week, but there'll be a released episode that week. And basically, uh, depending on how you do it, either the week before you get two tech snaps or... Uh, yeah. You get an uninterrupted supply of one tech snap a week. <laughs> yeah, you could, yeah, you could marathon, I'm sure. Show up live and just bring your cup of coffee and plow through it with us, just like we're going to be doing. Uh, all right, so uh, thanks, everyone, sending in your feedback. Uh, hopefully, we got, uh, we got a, good about, a good amount of them. There's still some more we haven't gotten to yet, but we'll be doing a whole bunch in episode 80 coming up real soon. All right, Alan, with all the feedback done, that means it's time for the tech snap roundup. And welcome to the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories that didn't quite fit into the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them. Maybe give you some links to follow up and read on your own after the show. I wouldn't call it homework. I'd just call it a little extra reading. And uh, they're almost exclusively supplied by the Tech Snap subreddit at links.techsnap.tv. Alan, sir, are you ready for the first Roundup story? That's right. It's, it's not homework. It's bettering yourself. Yeah, there you go. It's expanding. Utilizing the technologies of Instapaper help as well, I might add. Or, you know, utilizing the technology of your brain. <laughs> <laughs> Utilize the technology of your brain. That should be our slogan. Uh, all right, so this first story's got me all fired up, Alan. I'm all angry because yes. I didn't even know this was going on. But apparently Rackspace has been the target of repeated t- patent trolls. And if the headline isn't misleading me, it's because they host GitHub. <laughs> Have you heard this? This is you, normally uh, not so much. I don't. I guess there's no similar thing for patents, but for copyright lawsuits, Rackspace is protected by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act under the Safe Harbor provision, s- such that basically only after a company has sent Rackspace a legitimate uh, DMCA takedown notice, and Rackspace has failed to take down the content. Can somebody try to sue Rackspace? Although when it's a patent, there isn't any protection like that. 
So here's what the uh, here's what the pl- patent troll says. Uh, and Rackspace, by the way, has a very frank post on their blog, which I actually really respect. Uh, this says uh, the suit claims that Rackspace infringes on personal web patents by the by its manufacture, use, sale, importation, and or offer for sale of the following products and or services within the personal web patent field. Rackspace's cloud servers and GitHub, Cub ho- GitHub code hosting service. It's apparent that the people filing the suit don't even understand the technology or their products enough to realize that Rackspace cloud services and GitHub are completely different products from different companies. By now, it's widely right. known that GitHub is hosted at Rackspace, but beyond that, there's no other connection between the two companies. Yeah, like, you know, Rackspace cloud is something that maybe these trolls have in their eyes a legitimate patent claim against, but yeah, Rackspace has no responsibility for GitHub at all. I know. <laughs> and they should be trying to sue GitHub, not Rackspace. Oh, man. But it seems like some patent lawyer that doesn't know how to use the internet did like an IP lookup and decided, oh, that IP belongs to Rackspace. Therefore, we're suing Rackspace. Oh, jeez. Makes- Hopefully, that means that Rackspace can get the case dismissed on the grounds that the filer is an idiot. Yeah, and every time one of these stupid cases gets dismissed, it chips away at the whole practice, I hope. Um, let's yep. talk about this crime attack because uh, we, we mentioned it in the last roundup. We're keeping tabs on it in this roundup. And uh, many uh, many ways to break SSL with crime attacks, experts warn. This is coming from ArsTechnica.com. Security professionals are recommending that operators of websites that are offering uh, HTTPS disable bandwidth saving compression features to prevent the recently disclosed attack that permits hijacking of uh, encrypted browsing sessions. Yes. Crime is a clever backronym for compression ratio Info leak made easy. <laughs> uh, basically, because of the way the headers get compressed in when you're doing SSL, it means that uh, some information gets leaked in that case, and uh, someone might be able to get certain information, for example, from a cookie uh, from the headers. Mm. If you don't use compression in the headers, then you don't have this problem. Uh, however, at the moment... The setting to change that in things like Apache 2.2, which is the most predominant version, is not really straightforward. It is in Apache 2.4, but not so much in 2.2. Uh, and at this time, nobody knows if Amazon's Elastic, Lo- uh, Elastic Load Balancer does this or not, because most people would use that to offload the SSL from Amazon. Uh, and so there's basically, it's all up in the air at the moment. Hmm. Uh, but... Yes, people might consider disabling the bit of compression you would get using SSL. Wow. Uh, most likely, you're going to use um, gzip or deflate in the web server to compress the content anyway. So the savings you're getting in compressing just the header is very minimal anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Very good point. Uh, it, was, it was funny because uh, the researchers in their little synopsis about it uh, for the conference they were giving this talk at... It was like, you know, we're going to, there's a big thing with SSL and it's going to, I don't know, it's, it was, it's going to be bad for the environment. <laughs> Where it's like, this is going to be bad for everybody. Everybody's going to get well, burned well, no, by but this like, one. No, they specifically made the, the comment that it was not going to be a green fix because it was going to not have that little bit of compression okay. and therefore use more internet, which uses more power, which but is... But doesn't it then, because you're not having to compress it, use less processor cycles, which probably takes more power, so you're actually probably saving power because you're using less Probably, CPU. yes. Hmm. Maybe, it's, maybe it is a green one, after all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Alec, I want to talk about this next story in the roundup because this kind of thing makes me so pissed off. I just, yeah. I hate telefo- telephone carriers. Uh, so have you ever wondered why the uh, cell phone company's data usage doesn't match up what the phone stats which are tracking the in and out interfaces on the phone say so you think those would be accurate well there's actually a very easy to understand reason why a recent study and this by the way didn't come from the phone company somebody had to study this at ucla uh shows that carriers generally count data usage correctly but it depends on your definition of correct Exactly. Yeah. They're they're tr- they're counting data as it's transmitted from the cell phone tower. If you receive it or not, that's not their problem. So if they yeah. transmit data and your phone drops a few packets, you're paying for those packets. Or more more prominently, if you're for example moving, for example you're, you know, or or using, switching towers, using, yeah. Yeah. So basically if you're moving between towers, uh if the tower where you're not 
where you're not in range anymore is transmitting that data. You're being billed for it. Yeah. Uh, and then when the tower near you realizes that you're over here now and, you and transmit that. the data, yeah. you, get pay, you pay for it twice. Right. So it may be a good idea not to use too much data while not standing still. <laughs> uh, now, the plus side to all of this, and this is the part I'd love to see more information about, the same group says they figured out a way to construct DNS requests so that way the carrier didn't even count it as da d uh, data usage. Right, because uh, most of the carriers are counting uh, the data more at the closer to the application layer. Yeah. And uh, not, you know, at like the... Uh, physical layer and so yes uh, they basically give you DNS for free yeah. and so by uh, we've heard about before about using DNS to transfer data just as a way to do it kind of surreptitiously and get around censorship and yeah, so on yeah he said they transferred 200 megabytes yeah didn't even get detected uh, yeah. he also said that uh, by their calculations most customers are probably on average charged about 5 to 7 5 to percent more than what they actually consume right uh, which seems uh, you know like BS. Well, no, this seems like a, a low number. Uh, but then again, most people aren't using all that much data while moving. Well, very, the reason very, why it so. upsets me is because they keep eliminating these unlimited plans and they keep lowering the cap. Like, you know, I get four yep. gigs a month now and I used to have unlimited. It just, all this crap just, it just really yes. bugs me because uh, it's artificial. You know, it's all artificial constrictions. Well, more importantly, the, the cause behind it is fairly simple. It was uh, actually something Stefan said last night. It's like, the cell phone carriers spend their money buying sports teams and stadiums instead of upgrading their infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. This and, and so instead of, you know, getting more bandwidth so that they can sell you your, you know, an unlimited plan or, you know, 10 gigabytes for your mobile phone, uh, they instead just keep charging you a lot for a tiny amount of bandwidth and don't upgrade their infrastructure so they have an excuse. Uh, you know, I should have included uh, the, uh, the imagery. I don't know if you saw this last week, but somebody did a flyover of Apple's data center and the solar farm that they have for that thing. Did you see that? No, I didn't. It is totally nuts. It would have gone perfect with this next story in the roundup. Microsoft wants Time. to nix uh, all backup generators at their data centers. They're done with them, Alan. They say they're inefficient, they're clunky, and while most, uh, while most data center guys would say their diesel generator is a symbol of their reliability, Microsoft thinks they could be replaced by something like Bloom Power Cells, which Apple and eBay use, maybe natural gas generators, something a little more energy efficient, maybe fuel cells if something like that could work. Um, what do you think, Alan? Would you be well, comfortable at a data center that doesn't have a, G a diesel? Well, yes and no. Um, I've seen diesel generators have problems before. Oh, For yeah. For example, <laughs> uh, one of the very first episodes of TechSnap, I think, uh, we talked about the failure at one of my former ISPs, where basically they stopped doing the regular maintenance, and basically there was some corrosion, and the diesel generator kicked on, but it didn't transfer power uh, through the UPS batteries into the computers, so they all went off when the, U when the batteries ran out. Mm. Uh, then another example is uh, at Pier 1, at the ISP we're at now, they have N plus 1 redundant generators because generators, in this case, they're like locomotive engines, but it's an engine. It can break down. Uh, and for uh, they do tests on them, uh, I think uh, once a month or once a quarter, uh, where they test them and make sure everything's still working. Oh, yeah. During one of those tests, the muffler on generator A exploded, Yikes. which I'm guessing would have been very scary if you were there. <laughs> and would have really sucked if it happened during an emergency. So glad they were testing it. Well, during this test, all the load was on that generator. Oh. Luckily, they have N plus one generators. Ah. So that meant there was a third generator yes. for it to fail over to. And also the batteries sit in the middle to any momentary interruptions right, right. get smoothed out. Yeah. So no customers noticed. There was no impact. Uh, but that generator was basically down, for, and it was going to be a while before they could get, well, not a while, but a couple of days before they could get replacement parts and fix it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they immediately paid, I'm guessing would have been an exorbitant fee to have a mobile one megawatt generator brought onto the site. Mm. It took about six hours. Uh, so for about six hours, they only had enough generators to run everything. <laughs> Not enough generators to run everything and have a backup. Intense. Uh, and then so then the backup generator got there. Uh, never ended up actually being required, but 
their SLA says that they will provide 100% power uptime, so they make sure they have N plus 1 all the time. Uh, and so that shows, you know, the problems you might have with a generator is it can break down or it can explode or, mm-hmm. you know, all kinds of problems. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yes, there, you know, there's some appeal then to the idea of using a fuel cell or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and if you remember, we had the, the war story from IBM where nobody put, they, they did their monthly tests on the diesel generator. Yeah. And nobody thought that, well, after all those tests, we've used up all the gas. I need some gas, yeah. <laughs> and then the power's out and it was behind the electric gate. And so they couldn't open the gate to get more power into it uh, or more <clears throat> gas, uh, diesel into the generator so that it could run and make electricity. Anyway. Now, uh, I, uh, before we jump from this story, <laughs> I did find those pictures for those of you watching the video version. Ah, it's a 200 okay. acre farm of uh, Apple Solar Farm, and it is, it is the most insane thing. Does it say how much power it makes? Well, I, I, don't, I think they might power the whole damn thing. Right, I'm just wondering about how much power that is. For example, like know. the data center I'm at is basically they have one megawatt generator for each, uh, what they call them, pods, uh, which only holds so many servers, and then they have the redundants. Uh, it uh, generates, it generates the, so the, the, it's a 200 acre farm, only 100 acres at this point are in operation, they generate 20 megawatts currently. That's and great. then they're going to build up another farm, another 100 acres, which will generate another 20 megawatts. So they'll have a grand total of 40 megawatts from the, from the farm. Although I guess that's not 24-7, but still. Yeah, uh, I guess not, right? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> but, you know, they probably make enough selling that during the day back to the utility that the power they buy at night, uh, when, since power at night is cheaper anyway, is uh, not that big of a deal. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, obviously, solar cells don't make good backup power source. No. Um, but, <clears throat> like, Microsoft was talking about using uh, natural gas once. So that usually means connecting to, you know, a city natural gas supply. Uh, now, part of the idea behind diesel generators is that you have big fuel tanks on site, and basically the site becomes self-sufficient in an emergency. Yeah. For example, a natural disaster. Yeah. Uh, now, if some natural disaster causes the gas natural pipeline. gas company to have to shut down, or, or you know, if it takes out their pumping stations, or mm-hmm. you know, for safety reasons, mm-hmm. uh, especially in California, you know, if there's an earthquake, they might shut down all the natural gas. Right. And so, d- is that actually as reliable as having your own supply of diesel in a tank on your property that? is right. going to be there when you need it. Well, and the other thing, too, is just going back to the, real quick, going back to the solar thing, as uh, pointed out in the chat room, is uh, I'm sure what Apple's numbers there are peak power generation, right? Whereas a solar, yep. gen- a diesel, a solar is going to vary in the terms of power that generates, whereas diesel or, uh, or a natural gas will be a consistent delivery of power. So there's right, another thing. Right, but we're talking about uh, the, the solar they're using as basically to, uh, to offset their base load somewhat. Uh, whereas yeah, diesel yeah. is more of an emergency. Yeah, yep. It's not like they're going to run the diesel generators 24-7 in order to generate their main supply of power. Right, right. Um, but yeah, um, if I was building a new data center, I might be tempted to try one of these other technologies. If I had an existing data center, if I tried one of the new technologies, I probably wouldn't get rid of the diesels just in case. No, yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, let's uh, talk about... Oh, go ahead. Basically, I don't know if I trust any new fangled fuel cells as much as a diesel generator just yet yeah yeah it's like yeah ebay's using it but that's fine for ebay but how, how many times have they had to fail over to it what happens and it's probably the not their after? only data center so if that yeah, one goes what happens you know with the fuel cells after they're five years old how does that work mm. and so on so take that ebay all right so i want to talk about this next story in the roundup i uh, i haven't seen a lot of reporting on this i it's one of those stories when they say China's attacking somebody again. It's like, okay, well, you always claim it's China. But uh, China cyber attacks hit Japan uh, in the island row. According to this, uh, at least 19 Japanese websites, including uh, the government's ministry website uh, and a hospital website and a court website, have come under cyber attack, apparently from China. This is what police are saying uh, from Tokyo. Uh, many of the websites were alerted, uh, were altered to show messages proclaiming Chinese sovereignty over the islands that are in dispute right now. And uh, the MPA has confirmed about 300 Japanese organizations were listed as potential targets for cyber attack on a message board that apparently China's hacktivism groups frequent. Right. So this seems less along the lines of what we consider a cyber attack 
where government agents are trying to break in and steal something, and more along the lines of hacktivism, where a bunch of Chinese people want to write pro-China messages on people's websites by defacing them. And I got to admit, it's a nice island. It looks really pretty. So I can understand how they're getting upset about it, because I'd want that island too. So I'd go deface some websites if I were them. Seems personally, re- seems totally like a reasonable response to that whole situation. So, well, you might not be able to say that, you know, the Chinese government isn't encouraging this. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's right. quite the same as You're right. a state-sponsored cyber attack that under, you know, basically defa- defacing some random website it's not a, is not, not the a same state cyber as, attack. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's not a cyber attack or it's... It's not cyber warfare in the idea of going after infrastructure. And when you write the headline, right? China attacks, right? It kind of sounds yeah. like the government issued the attack. Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, where in this case, point. it just seems to be like a bunch of teenagers in China decided yeah. to deface some websites. <laughs> and used an island as an excuse. Uh, all right. So this last story in the roundup is another story for Oracle. A flaw yes. in the Oracle logon protocol leads to easy password cracking. Now, that sounds great, Alan. Yeah. Uh, honestly, the... Uh, the way it's described reminds me of the one we had with MySQL that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. The difference here is that the Oracle one doesn't use two loops of SHA uh. on the password. Uh-huh. So when you brute force it, you eventually get back the actual password. Oh, wow. Well. So rather than, <laughs> rather than being able to replicate the token and get in, you get the original password and get in. Wow. Uh, meaning that you know, you get more information than just access to the database. Uh, Because, you know, people tend to use the same password for stuff, so maybe that password also gets you root on the web server or something. (laughs) Oracle, you're just rocking it these days, guys. Come on. Yep. Well, uh, hmm. have you used much Oracle, actually? Nope. Yeah, I haven't really either. I I, I guess it exists. It's kind of a big enterprise thing. Like, I, you know, I hear some of my programmer friends that work at governments and corporations and so on complain about Oracle all the time. Yeah. I mean, the bank uh, I worked at for a while, you know, evaluated a couple of different products based on Oracle, but we never actually pulled the trigger because back then our main database was stored on a System 390 mainframe. <laughs> Probably would have been an Oracle box now. I don't, I don't know what they would put it on now, but yeah, it's crazy. Yep. Alan, I believe that brings us to the end of the show. Yep. Now, uh, TechSnap is live. We have an awesome chat room that's going the entire time we're watching. We're pulling stuff out of the chat room constantly. You can be a part of that. Just join us over at jblive.tv on Thursday afternoons at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is? 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And uh, we encourage you to join us live. Also, you can join us in the uh, audio stream. If you're at work or doing a commute, just go to jblive.info at your desk. And, uh, yeah, see, the chat room's giving themselves props right now. Good job, chat room. (laughs) I love when they're like, yeah, we're great. Yeah, you are, guys. You are great. So there you have it. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of TechSnap. And we'll be right back here next week.